Okay, what I'm doing right now is uh, we have all of these uh, bags out here. And as you can see, we're getting ready to winterize these. These are going to stay out here. Now, the bag to stay out here under the ice that I mentioned earlier. Because, uh, as you can see, you can compress them. And uh, sea ice can weigh a lot. And they won't completely crush them. They'll just sit right on top of them. They don't completely crush them because the underside of the ice is actually a little bit. So here we are. Just going to take this uh, zip tie right here. Run that up through. And you want to cinch it down. Very tight. And it uh, looks like Peter has come out today, as I mentioned earlier. Here we have a periwinkle, which is another uh, predator which we don't really like, but he's not that harmful out here compared to the moon snail and the crab. Throw him over there, and we'll just uh, keep uh, repeating this process. And also, what out here we get a lot of birds, as you can see. So we get piping plovers, which are also an endangered species, which can benefit from what we're doing out here. So we'll, sometimes when we're working, we will break a couple or everything like that. We'll break a couple clams. We'll throw those off to the side. And uh, they, they'll come and eat them, providing a food source. Now, that's not a food source that they're not used to having, so it's not like they're benefiting from directly from us being out here or we're altering their environment. That happens out in nature naturally when, uh, when a shellfish gets broken due to tidal changes or things like that. Let's just move right over here. And see, this is what we really don't want the bags to do, as I was mentioning earlier having them all go to the back, but since these oysters are bigger, they're going to stop fusing together. It's when they're smaller and actually growing at an enormous rate. Now, the oysters grow faster than the uh, steamers. That's due to they're able to put a higher volume of water to themselves a day. And since we have those in the water all the time, unlike the steamer, which the steamer needs to have a break and be dry, they all grow a lot more, therefore taking the nutrients in, like the phytoplankton and all the other types of algae that are out there. And also one thing that we really emphasize is the uh, mesh size. The mesh size, the bigger the mesh size, the more water it allows to come through. And the more water that comes through is the more water and the more nutrients that an oyster can take in. Now, you would say, well, then you need to have the proper sizing and everything like that. Yes, you do. Depending on the oyster, if you have, when we buy our seed, our seed is actually roughly the size of this right here. So we have to have a smaller mesh. And then you, you would say, well, with the smaller mesh, you would think that less water would come and get go through it. You are correct in that. But we need to protect the seed. But also an issue that we have is in the summertime, we get the mung. And the mung is when the water starts to get warm and we have an algae bloom down here. And that will clog up the bag. And that will put sand in the bag. And sand to oysters is the, the worst enemy. Because sand in an oyster, as we do know, it can cause an irritation and make a pearl, but that rarely happens. But that will suffocate the oyster and its ability to filter because they're always open and therefore they'll die and if we have that happening on a scale we can lose our crop because we haven't done our flotation right but right now we don't really have to worry about that because like I said we're just doing winterization the rough process these will actually go dormant for the winter therefore a lot of oyster we've got people who do aquaculture will actually take their oysters out they'll dig a hole in the ground back on land and they'll put them in there because since oysters go dormant they don't know that they're in water or if they're out of water. Here we are we're just gonna wrap up our last cable tie here. But all in all you're out here you're all by yourself or if you're with your partner it's really nice out here. You get to watch the sun rise out of the east in the morning. And then in the evening, if you end up coming out here, you get to watch the sun set in the west right there. 
a beautiful environment. You have the marshlands here and everything like that. And uh, you get to see how the seacoast has evolved over the years. You can see that there's a new house being built over there. Some of these houses weren't here uh, at least five years ago. So there has been a boom in the uh, seacoast and the water dealing house economy. And actually, some, the way we find our, our way out here is in the morning is we don't have our buoys out here, so we can't look and see our bright fluorescent buoys at this time of year. We make a landmark on the land, which is over in Dennis, those water towers over there, and we'll line ourselves with those water towers, and we'll walk straight, and we'll naturally, we will run into our grant. You don't want to go to someone else's grant and think it's yours, because then you just wasted all your time walking after their grant, and now you got to find yours. And over here we have Rock Harbor. Rock Harbor is also another grant site. They're more notorious, they're in the paper. A Rock Harbor oyster does taste different than a Bees River oyster. Due to, since we have the Bees River oyster, more nutrients come out of the marshland and everything like that. Therefore, we can soak those up and with our oysters and they'll become sweeter. Versus over in Rock Harbor, they just have the bay and they have the harbor, which their oysters help more as a filter for as we know, harbors, they get accidental spills all the time. They'll filter that out of the environment and a lot of other nasty things that can happen in a harbor.